the loop. The loop. You have the divine spark. The loop. Do or do not. At least don't try. The loop. Hey there, this is Misha, and welcome to episode number 16 of The Loop. This is part two of the conversation I've, I'm having with Eric Hudson on the Amazon Leadership Principles. In the first episode, we went over the uh, first eight leadership principles, and Eric broke those down in quite some detail, shared some context uh, from having been at Amazon for over, over eight years. and. Uh, as a recruiter and a bar raiser, he had a lot of interesting tips and insights uh, and some stories to share around those principles. And in today's conversation, we go over, over the, the, the second half, uh, the, the, the last eight leadership principles, uh, including the two new principles that Amazon added in the last year or so. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of uh, stuff we packed into this conversation, a lot of examples, a lot of sample questions that Amazon might ask you, a lot of tips, a lot of considerations that uh, you might think about when you are going in for an interview and, and how to sort of think about these principles. So super, super useful. And um, yeah, I encourage I encourage you to uh, definitely take, take some notes here because I, I think there's just a lot of information. So if you are going in for the interview, then, then I think, um, yeah, th this is going to be super practical for you. So I hope you enjoy. Hey, Eric, how's it going? Hey, Misha, how are you? Good, good. So we are back for round two of Amazon Leadership Principles Breakdown. Um, in, in our first conversation, we went through, I believe, the first eight principles, and you had basically uh, unpacked each principle in more detail and shared some stories, which were really insightful and I think useful for anyone who is interviewing or uh, yep, even interested in Amazon's culture. So I think uh, I think we can continue in the same format and just go through the uh, the next eight leadership principles. Uh, two of them were actually added, I think, recently in the last in the last year or so. So uh, interested to ask about those because I really don't know much about them um, since they're relatively new. So. Why don't we jump into it? Um, Let's do it. So the next one on the list is bias for action. And this is defined as, oh, this is what it says on Amazon's website. Speed matters in business. Many decisions and actions are reversible and do not need extensive study. We value calculated risk taking. Yeah, so this is a this is a, a really important one when it comes to Amazon. So when you think about Amazon, what do you think about, right? You think about uh, speed. Uh, obviously, you can buy things online. You can buy it with speed. So Amazon prioritizes itself on being fast, right? Even Jeff Bezos said in the early days about how um, you know ten years from now, we know that customers are going to love low prices and they're going to want things to be delivered to them very quickly, right? Uh, I can't imagine a world where people are going to say, I, I wish they would take longer for them to deliver me my package, right? Um, so bias for action goes back to that sense of urgency and being able to deliver or be able to do things in a very timely manner, right? Most of bias for action can actually be affiliated with deliver results, right? Which, which basically means that, uh, you're, you're getting things done and you're getting things done uh, with, with a timeline or with speed involved, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about the system of the highest standards. The system of the highest standards is more based on, uh, the quality of things. You're getting quality done. Whereas blast for action is all about that speed and that sense of urgency. So questions that you can, uh, expect to be asked for, for bias for action are tell me about a time when you had to deliver something, uh, very quickly under a tight deadline or, um, one that really throws people for a loop is, Tell me about a time when you took a calculated risk in your job. What was that calculated risk and how did you do it, right? So basically what they're trying to see is, do you prioritize speed if you can mitigate and calculate a risk in business and and how you can get things out the door? Um, not to knock on Amazon, but they're not known for their, their UI or they're not known as being 
um, the highest quality product. For example, Kindle, right? In comparison to iPad, it's it's not the same quality. You're going to get it at a lot cheaper price, but the the, the UI, UX, um, the, the interface, all of it is a little bit cheaper than what you get for an iPad. But Amazon doesn't care. They just want to get it out fast, and they want to get it out and, and deliver it to you um, so that you can have something like that. Same thing goes for uh, like Prime Video. If you look at Amazon Prime Video and you compare the UI to Netflix or HBO Max or Disney Plus, it's horrendous, you know. And the reason for that is Amazon has a bias for action to get things out very quickly and get it to the customer. And as long as the, the customer is adopting it, uh, that's all that matters to them. So um, if, if you're thinking through your examples for bias for action, you really want to think about examples that demonstrate you delivering things under a tight deadline. Um, but you want to be careful because you don't want to look like you're like you're not somebody who uh, is sloppy or doesn't have attention to detail. You do take your time. You do focus on doing things right, but you're doing things very quickly. So that's bias for action. Got it. And what if you are working in a company where there's an environment that is a bit more slow and bureaucratic and maybe maybe as an individual, you still have some bias for action and uh, you're very proactive perhaps, but you're in this environment where it doesn't give you many opportunities or you get sort of shut down pretty quickly. Could you still be a fit culturally for Amazon or how do you, how do you sort of tease that out from someone? You can be, right? I mean, just because that's been your experience doesn't mean that's not, uh, you can't adapt to a culture that that is as fast paced as Amazon's, right? So, like, if you've done things in your personal life or, or in, like, on, as a side gig or, mm-hmm. uh, or, or something along those lines, like, you've, you've demonstrated a time when you've done bias for action, that's what you need to use. A lot of people get so hung up on what they're currently doing and their corporate career, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the best examples I've ever heard have come from people who've done uh, things on the side. I had someone who, uh, created a, an app for, for basically, uh, for, for people to do private shuttles for kids so they didn't have to have their kids get bullied on school buses, right? Um, mm-hmm. they could follow the kid with an app. They, there was a camera so they could see what the kids were doing, right? And she did that on the side and they absolutely loved that example. She was working for a very bureaucratic insurance company, but she was able to use that example for bias for action and how she was able to solve a problem in her community, right? So it doesn't have to be so isolated and tied mm. to your to to just your, your corporate job. So like try and like think outside the box. Um and, and if not, I'm surely even in your bureaucratic day to day, you've had opportunities to to get things done very quickly. Right. And mm. and like and, and how have you contributed to those things? Got it. Yeah man. Thanks for clarifying that. So let's move on to the next principle, frugality. Accomplish more with less. Constraints breed resourcefulness, self-sufficiency, and invention. There are no extra points for growing headcount, budget size, or fixed expense. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this is the forgotten leadership principle, right? So majority, I would say 99% chance, you're not going to get this on your interview. It is the one leadership principle that's always been looked over in the interview process. The only person who's going to be selected, so if you're watching this, the only person who's going to be uh, interviewed against legality is, you guessed it, finance, right? So like if you're a financial analyst or financial manager, senior finance manager, accounting, internal audit, that is usually the only people that get legality on their interview. If you're anything else, product manager, program manager, software development, engineer, sales, HR, whatever, more than likely, very, very, very high chance you're not going to get frugality on your interview, right? But for those that do interview, because I do work with a lot of finance people um, and coaching on, on Keras, um, it, it, you, you really just want to focus on when you've been able to create cost savings, right? How have you created cost savings? Uh, how, you know, if you've done P&L with cost savings, that's very important. Um, another thing to think about frugality is it's not just being cheap, right? So a lot of people think of frugality as, like, oh, I have frugality. I'm, I'm very cheap in my, my day-to-day personal life. That's most of the time what people tell me when they were talking about 
frugality um, if, if they're a finance person. And I say, well, don't just focus on that. Amazon's really big on investments. So like frugality, uh, it's not just, oh, I'm being cheap about my resources. Um, I, I really know how to invest. So like that could also be for maximizing headcount. So Amazon is, it's notorious for headcount is gold with Amazon, right? Uh, it's so difficult to get headcount and, and the people that know how to get it or know how to be able to influence the data to get that headcount are, are usually considered who you want on your team, right? So if you can find somebody that's been able to do that in the past or an example of that, um, that, that's usually looked at, uh, very highly. So like on the frugality perspective, right? They'll ask you questions like, how have you done things with low resources without much resources in the past? And they want to see examples of you being lean and running a lean team and then getting it done. And then ultimately using the data from the success you have with that lean team to get you more headcount because you, you can show them the investment that you've made. So, um, so my big thing about frugality is 99% chance. If you're listening to this, you're probably not going to have it, but if you do, Focus on investment, focus on uh, your ability to do things without uh, much resources and focus on cost savings. Got it. Yeah. So what about the the sort of cultural side of things here where like if you're working at a company where, you know, you always fly business class and you have maybe access to like a company car and like a computer, it's like all the stuff you don't get at Amazon, right? Notoriously, it's like you're not going to really get much. I don't even know if you get a computer or a phone or anything, which is quite common in other big tech companies. So is there something about the sort of expectations coming in as a, as a candidate to what you can expect internally? And, and like, does that relate to frugality and those examples that I just shared? Yeah, definitely. So culturally, Amazon, I had friends who came from Apple, who came to Amazon, and it was quite the rude awakening. Like at Apple, you can fly first class wherever. You can fly business class wherever you want to. Um, there are some companies like, uh, I think VMware, where you can fly first class international. Amazon doesn't care, right? Frugality. So you will have to fly coach wherever you go. I, I had a manager one time who got a, uh, he had a back issue and he's the only person who I've ever been able to see get an accommodation, right? First class because of his back, right? So like, like that's, that's the only time when they usually are open to that. Yeah, you get a laptop. I mean, of course, you have to do the work. Um, but but you're not going to get a, a, a MacBook. You're going to get a Lenovo ThinkPad for sure. <laughs> and you're you're also going to be you're also going to get uh uh you're also you're not going to get a phone, right? Your phone you you're on your own. Uh, I think the the max they got up to was they give you fifty dollars for a phone a month, and and they don't really advertise it when you get onboarded. So they don't want you to do it. So like I knew how to do it because I I I've been there for so long. But, uh, it's a, it's a super frugal company. I will say this. Whenever you do travel, they don't really care about meals. Um, I, I was, I would take my team out for, you know, great steakhouses. I would take them out to, uh, when I was in Singapore doing the Singapore thing, we would, we would go to Marina Bay Sands. We nice. would do the, uh, you know, chili crab, all that stuff. Uh, they're, they're good with that. They're, they're, they're good with the leader taking it, their team out to a nice dinner. So I, I got to do that at least. Um, <laughs> I think that's the only only time I let you splurge. Awesome, yeah. Well, that, that's something at least. So, uh, so let's move on to the next one. Earn trust. Leaders listen attentively, speak candidly, and treat others respectfully. They are vocally self-critical, even when doing so is awkward or embarrassing. Leaders do not believe their or their team's body odor smells of perfume. They benchmark themselves and their teams against the best. Yeah, so earn trust, a major leadership principle, right? So like if you haven't been paying attention, pay attention. Because if you do not do well on earn trust, you won't get the job. Period. There is uh if you if you're I've seen so many loops where they've been good or they've been you know, they show a lot of great qualities, but they don't do very well on earn trust and they never get the job. Because if you can't earn someone's trust, you can't earn a customer's trust. You don't have customer obsession. Um, so earn trust is a is a major uh, thing. Not not just in the interview. Like if they think that you're like lying about stuff in the interview, they'll mark you red for earn trust. So um, earn trust is a major leadership principle. Hmm. But it, how they how you demonstrate earn trust in the interview is different than just earning trust. Like as, as like you would think. 
earning someone's trust, right? So you think, oh, earning trust, like you're, you're basically trying to earn the trust of a customer. But the questions that they ask you, um, they phrase it in different ways in different scenarios of earning trust. So they want to see not only you earning someone's trust, like not like it's just like a salesperson going up and earning the trust of like, uh, I don't know, like Qualcomm or something for AWS, but they want to see you in very difficult situations earn trust, right? So like uh, one of the questions is, tell me about a time when you had to communicate a change in direction that people had concerns with, right? Or tell me about a time when you had a critical piece of feedback uh, from your manager. Um, how did you handle it and, what, and, and how did you react? Tell me about a time when you made a commitment to a stakeholder, but you couldn't fulfill that, uh, that commitment as promised, right? So those are very difficult questions because they're forcing you in the situations that, um, you know, you're, you're, in, you're in an uncomfortable situation. And, and despite that uncomfortable situation, they want to see you still being able to earn trust and overcoming adversity uh, to earn their trust, right? So like, how do you do that? How do you communicate a message that I mean, like a layoff, right? Like, how do you communicate a layoff? If you're a big leader. How do you communicate a layoff? Knowing, I mean, nobody's going to be excited that they're going to lose their job, right? Like no, no one in, in this world. I mean, maybe some people, but like, if you if you need a paycheck, like, you you're not going to be excited about that layoff. How are you going to communicate that message strategically, right? Um, I'll give you an example of what not to do, right? Like the Better.com CEO. I'm not sure if you saw that where he laid everybody off on Zoom and it, it went viral, right? So like. Uh, how are you handling conversations like that that's difficult for people? And um, how are you in those contentious situations? And despite those situations being contentious, how are you able to navigate and earn people's trust? So um, earn trust, major leadership principle. Uh, and also you want to show integrity. Because if you're not showing integrity uh, in your example, they, they really don't like that. Uh, that's mm -hmm. it's usually a big red flag. Uh, if they think that you lack integrity, and they think that you are not someone who is uh, uh, going to make it at, at Amazon. And, they, and if they catch you lying, like, like, okay, so you said this number, but now you're saying this number. That doesn't make sense, right? So, like, if you get caught in that and you, you use a number and it's incorrect and you have to go back and say it, they're probably going to they're probably gonna mark you as uh, uh, a, a concern for earned trust. And the reason for that is they want to – they have a uh, data now that shows that you obviously can't trust, them, right? So uh, that's not somebody you want to repeat. So uh, earn trust, major leadership principle. Um, my big takeaway from that is making sure you can build relationships in uh, ambiguous and difficult situations. Awesome, yeah. It, it sound, it's, it's really clear. I mean, the example about integrity and, and sort of lying in the interview, I think people will slip up sometimes not because they're liars but because they're nervous and yep. this kind of goes into the next principle which is dive deep but it's like not knowing the numbers or not 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 having thought through those examples and you know whatever you've done in the past can cause you to fudge things because you just want to say something and not look like a complete idiot and uh then, then, then you're on your back foot, and then that that's actually the wrong approach, right? And then you've you've lost you've lost the trust. So, I, I think I think uh, let's let's go into the next one, dive deep, and talk more about that. So, uh, dive deep. Uh, leaders operate at all levels, stay connected to the details, audit frequently, and are skeptical when metrics and anecdote differ. No task is beneath them. Yeah, dive deep is a very important leadership for technical folks. So if you're a technical person, uh, as much as frugality is 99% not going to be your leadership principle, dive deep is 99% going to be your leadership principle. This is a very important leadership principle for, uh, really, really anyway, it's technical, any data analysts, business analysts, anything where you're going to have to go deeper than, um, than the surface, right? And dive deep really, relates back to uh, in the technical world, uh, your technical assessment. So uh, non-tech people, you're going to have nothing but leadership principles as your guide to, to get the job. If you're tech, you have the leadership principles and you have to pass the tech bar. Most of the time when you're doing the tech assessment or you're doing the tech bar and someone's doing the tech screen, they'll do the tech screen as half of your interview and the other half of the interview is diabetes. That's majority of technical screens, right? I'm talking uh, L4 and above, right? Um, so dive deep is 
is one of those great leadership principles to prepare for. Um, it's kind of like uh, Invent and Simplify, whereas you they're basically asking you nine times uh, in that in that example that form of of when you've been able to dive deep into the details of something, right? So like we'll say everything is fine on the surface. It's kind of like uh, Michael Berry. If you're, if you're familiar with Michael Berry, uh, he's a uh, he's a hedge fund uh, uh, owner who basically shorted the market in 2009 for the mortgage-backed securities crisis, right? So the so he, he found that information, that data below the surface. Everything seemed fine. The economy was, was seemed like it was roaring. It seemed like things were going well. He dove deep and found data that was very concerning. That there was mortgages that were underwater, uh, and people who, who were holding them all had terrible credit scores and weren't paying their mortgages. So he saw the impending doom happening and was able to capitalize and put a big put on the market and made billions of dollars, right? So like, that's a very big analogy, but basically you're doing the same thing in dive deep. You're, you're trying to find a root cause problem. You're diving under the surface to, to get that problem. And then once you identify it, you bring it to the surface, but not in, and like a lot of people can bring the problem to the surface, but what Amazon wants to see is they want to see you bring it to the surface with a proposed solution, you running with that solution, you implementing it and you, and your contributions leading to some kind of big major impact that helps the company out. Right. So like for Michael Berry, he was able to, you know, obviously help his hedge for hedge firm, uh, make a lot of money. Because he was able to act on that data and he drove a solution, uh, that he saw fit, right? Um, he probably could have done a lot of other things to get people warning about that, but, uh, he decided to capitalize on it and make money. But it's the same thing for, uh, for dive deep. And it's always about digging deep into the details, getting to the root cause, um, your ability to research data to help understand, uh, something further that helps you make sound decisions. And, and how that is able to make an impact, uh, for yourself, for your team, and for your company. Um, and, and it's again, just like Invent Simplify, nine questions that ask the same thing over and over again. So you can think of two examples of when you dove deep and most likely, um, it'll answer all nine questions that's in their interview day. Yeah. Awesome. It's, yeah, this is a really important one. And I've also seen and, and, and heard that beyond this being just a leadership principle. This is also sort of a, almost like a technique or a tactic that interviewers will use where they are, the interviewers are diving deep into all of your examples, right? And so you exactly. sort of have to be ready, like regardless of, of this principle, like for everything you've prepared, you have to be ready to go a step further and explain your uh, problem solving, sort of your reasoning, why you did something, uh, and, and not just being at the surface level. So, so I think this is like one of the, yeah, definitely, like you said, one of the most important principles, uh, from, from multiple angles. Yeah. And that's a good point, Misha. Uh, they, they will do a process called peeling back the onion in your interview. So they'll ask a ton of follow up questions, more follow up questions you'll probably have in any interview you'll ever do for any company. And, and basically they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, everything about the situation. That's them diving deep as an interviewer at Amazon, right? And uh, they will go very deep. I've had several interviews where I was at Amazon. I, went, I had asked one interview question and I dove so deep in the interview that the entire hour went by. So be prepared for follow-up questions too. Yeah, that that's, that's a little bit in, of an intimidating thought where you've just asked one question and you spend the entire interview just poking at that question and talking about it obviously if yeah. you you know the, the question and you are you you're able to answer the question with a good example and talk in length about it then that that's that's great um and and you could probably get some some high high marks for that but if you don't then you're just like uh what do i you know what do i do what do i say here what what yeah. what, what do you do in that situation like if you just don't i mean if if the interviewer keeps drilling down and saying like why why'd you do this why'd you do that and you just you feel like it's not going well, um, what what can you do in that situation? Are you just like shit out of luck or? Well, I mean, <laughs> if you if you think it's not doing well, 
uh, then I, I mean it's probably not going well. Your gut's probably right, but but like don't be intimidated by it because you may not have been interviewed like that before, right? Be very frank. A lot of people haven't been interviewed that way. A lot of people haven't been spoken to and uh and just like diving deeper, deeper, deeper into every part of their example is just you know it's it's not the norm in in the world, right? Like most companies don't do that. So like even if you might be feeling uncomfortable, it's it's because it's just it's it's a natural feeling. Um, and my, my best advice is just to stay in the pocket, right? Uh, when I say stay, stay in the pocket, be calm, collected, uh, answer it to the best of your ability. One thing about a follow up question is you don't really need to worry about how long the follow up, the follow up answer is. Cause like most people are worried about like their full example being like three to five minutes or whatever. Whereas with a, the follow up question, they're asking you explicitly. They want to know that information. So it's okay to be a little verbose and over explain that. If you need to, um, it's also okay to ask clarifying questions back to them, right? So if you're like, well, what, what are you specifically looking for here? Cause here, let me, let me tell you what I did, but, but I just want to make sure I'm answering your question fully and understand what you, what you need from me here. Mm-hmm. So like you can, you can clarify and you can ask those, uh, d- during that, uh, the interrogation, uh, mm-hmm. what, what they, what they want to see. Um, but like if you feel like you're, you're, you're about to lose it and you're flustered. Best thing I can say is try and calm down. Try and calm down, take deep breaths and talk slower. Cause when you talk slower, it allows you to think more, right? Mm-hmm. Cause like if you, when you talk slow, then all of a sudden, like I'm doing it right now, <laughs> but like if you, the more you talk slow, the more it allows you to think and allows you to, uh, come up with a, with, with an answer. So, um, but yeah. if you, if you, do, if, you if you're not able to, you have to answer it too. You're not able to answer it like you're, yeah. 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 Could you, could you also do something like if you realize that the answer you're giving is maybe not registering with them or, um, it's not going very well, could you sort of stop yourself and say, Hey, I actually, I have a better example that I think will really answer this, this question. Can I, could you like switch your example halfway through or would that just be copping out? Uh, if you're early in the example, and you haven't mm-hmm. spent too much time on it. Yes, you can do that. Had someone recently, um, who was working with me on my, on my loot packages. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got a senior manager role for, uh, software development and he did that in his interview, but he said he was like four sentences in and then changed it up. So if I'm a bar raiser and I'm listening to an interview and someone says, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I need to start over because this is not the right example that's going to answer your question. I have one that's better. So let me tell that one. If it's just like right at the beginning of the example, I'm, I mean, that's fine. That's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about quality, quality of the example, not quantity. So if the quality of the example is where it needs to be, then, then, you know, it, it's fine. But if you're like 10 minutes into the story and you say you want to try another one, they're going to get pissed, right? They're going to be a little frustrated because they're like, okay, you just wasted 10 minutes of this interview. I only have an hour to see if you raise the bar for, for both of these leadership principles. So they're going to kind of feel like, kind of feel like they wasted their time. Okay. If you go, go all the way at the end and then have to basically change course. Got so. it. Yeah. That's good to know. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Have backbone, disagree and commit. Leaders are obligated to respectfully challenge decisions when they disagree, even when doing so is uncomfortable or exhausting. Leaders have conviction and are tenacious. They do not compromise for the sake of social cohesion. Once a decision is determined, they commit wholly. Yep. So have backbone, disagree, and commit is actually really two things. A lot of people think of backbone, disagree, and commit as you coming in, uh, you know, kicking chairs over, uh, you know, brute force, breaking through things, being relentless. And getting your way. That's actually not what it is. Uh, backbone is, is making sure that, that the culture at Amazon doesn't have the social cohesion that prevents customer obsession from happening. I'll give you an example. So, um, let's say you and I are in a meeting and I am saying, Misha, I would like to put this 10 foot pole on Amazon.com and I'm going to, and we're going to put it on there and you could sit there and say, okay, sure. I agree with you. I just, I'm just going to agree. 
Or you can say, be skeptical and say, well, let's get look at the data and make sure this is right. And then you measure the poll and you realize it's actually eight people, right? So now you have data that contradicts what I just said, and um, you're trying to influence me to do what's right. Because if you don't push back on me, what am I going to do? I'm going to put a 10-foot poll on Amazon.com. Someone's going to order that 10-foot poll, and they're going to be pissed that it's not the right size of what they wanted, right? And and then you know they're going to leave a bad review, one downstream defect. Number two, they're going to return it. And it's going to be a refund. So we didn't get the revenue on a person. Um, and number three, you're going to have more inventory that you're going to have to store, right? So like those are three downstream problems that can be caused because you didn't have backbone in that situation, right? So like backbone is more about making sure that you're pushing back on your peer or partner. And, and one thing about Amazon that is really different from most other companies is you can't really challenge your boss. And you can't really challenge a BP or a director. But that's very common at Amazon. An L4 can ask a question that's going to poke gaps and holes into a VP's strategy or execution. And I've seen it where a, a, an L4 person who, you know, just graduated about a year out of school asked a question in, uh, in a meeting on a QBR and, and she had the VP stuttering by the end of it because the VP couldn't answer her questions, uh, in a way that made sense. So, Backbone is so important, and, and most companies are very top down. Whereas Amazon tries to be, Amazon is top down in the way, right? I mean, Andy Jassy is the CEO, no doubt about that. But you can challenge the status quo by challenging thoughts and challenging things, and basically you're trying to influence people, uh, preferably with data, to come to your side, right? But that's only half backbone. So that's that's one half of the leadership principle. So the other half of it is disagreeing from that. So, uh, mm-hmm. so the half backbone piece. You can expect questions like, tell me about a time when you had disagreement with your manager. Uh, what, on something that was critical in business. How did you disagree? Right? And then what did that lead to? Um, and then for disagree and commit, it's, it's more about you disagreeing, but then you having a conviction that, uh, or someone else having a conviction that something is right and you disagreeing. But you don't have data to prove that they're wrong, right? So if you just squash that person's hopes and dreams of this idea, despite you not having the data to prove that they're wrong, then, then that stifles innovation. So disagreeing and committing is very important because, uh, let's say you have an idea and I, I say, I don't think that's going to work. That's not, that's not a good idea. It's not going to work. Um, and then you say, well, here's why I think it. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I mean, but I, I have, I, I, I'm seeing these trends happening. I think customers will, will really appreciate it because of this, this, and this, even though you don't have specific data. So as I don't have data, I'll say, okay, Misha, I, uh, I don't think it's going to work, but I'll disagree and I'll commit and I'll go along with it and I'll support you in any way possible. Right. So a disagreeing commit is you're still disagreeing. You're still saying, I don't think, I don't like this poll. Right. But now you don't have the data of the poll. Right. So I can't push back on you, but what I will say is I'll go along with you. So. Um, and there, and there's questions specific to the disagree and commit part too that say, tell me about a time when you disagree with a group decision, but you went along with the group decisions, you went along with the group decision anyway, right? So that's disagree and commit. But, uh, have background disagree and commit, so it's twofold, and you want to make sure that you have an example that addresses both of those things. Yeah, I want to highlight a couple of things there, because like you were saying with the, disagree part and have backbone, you know, there's definitely a expectation of leadership, right? At at Amazon, these are the leadership principles after all, and it's not about your title and how senior you are. And like you were just saying with the example of the level four, if someone is not even a manager, they've just, they've just joined, they've just graduated from school. uh, They actually have perhaps even a, a, a greater opportunity to show leadership at times because they don't, they're not tied down or held back by this sort of title and they, they have to really show uh, if they're going to disagree with someone, they really have to be on point. They have to show data. They have to have very logical explanations and they can, they can still influence, you know, they can still influence the, the, the conversation. And, and what you're saying is that's expected 
uh, you know, from everyone at every level, not just yep. people that have the, the title. Yep, exactly. And that's why yeah. Amazon's culture is, is so strong in that area. Um, and it even comes back to negotiation, right? In their, in their background classes on negotiation, they say, uh, never say yes to the first offer that you get, right? And, and that also goes back to backbone. <clears throat> Your ability to push back and say, well, I want more data just to make sense. So yeah, yeah, backbone, yeah. backbone is instrumental to Amazon and its success. Yeah. And, and then the second thing I was going to say is the, the disagree and commit part. I mean, obviously, it, it's really annoying when you have that person, that colleague who is just disagreeing with everything just to be disagreeable. And it can't it can be annoying. Right. But obviously, if they have data and then they've, uh, they've they've proven their point and it makes sense, then, you know, you're very grateful for that at the end of the day, uh, if, if they've been able to, to, to improve things. But there's sort of this line where, you know, once once you've discovered or decided on a um, on a direction, if that person is still sort of annoying and be like, well, this isn't going to work or they're negative about it or they still aren't really committing to it, then that actually causes friction and a bit of chaos, right? And, and uh, tension even within the team. So I think that's, it's really important to know where to draw that line. And, and then, like you said, disagree and commit with whatever, whatever has been decided. Otherwise you're just going to be battling and fighting constantly without ever um, having any sort of peace <laughs> um, in a way. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For cool. sure. So uh, let's move on to the last three, deliver results. Uh, okay. Leaders focus on the key inputs for their business and deliver them with the right quality and in a timely fashion. Despite setbacks, they rise to the occasion and never settle. Deliver results is by far the most simple of the leadership principles, right? I mean, uh, if you had to to rank leadership principles on complexity and difficulty, deliver results is usually pretty low, right? You you know use the think bigs, the the write a lot, the backbones, those are probably in the top harder, more complex leadership principles, um, more specific situations. But deliver results, if you can't get deliver results, I mean this is this is in the in the Amazon interview, this is T ball, right? So like it is teed up for you. And you have the opportunity to talk about a time when you deliver results in some capacity, right? So you, you can use, um, what I like to call your home run examples for deliver results. So like, think about the times in your career where you demonstrated some great successful, uh, thing, right? Or great successful turnout, or maybe you increase sales, or you increase revenue, whatever it is, deliver results. Is you to just doing um, whatever is considered a home run in your career, right? What are you most proud of? This is your opportunity to do it. So um, it's you know again, deliver results is pretty simple. So I'm not gonna sit here and like sugarcoat it, but uh, this and this is probably one that's, that's the most close to the line to a traditional company that's not like Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when have you delivered? What have, what have you done? Um, and what success have you had? So. Mm -hmm. um, I won't be the dead horse, but that, that's the awesome. results. Yeah, good. Yeah, this is like biggest accomplishment, right? This is where you get to yeah, brag exactly. about, about things a bit and and uh, you know explain explain how you made an impact. So, um, right. let's move on to the last two. These are two new leadership principles which have been added in the last year or so. And so I'm really curious to hear about them. I mean, I know you left Amazon uh, not too long ago, so. I think these were already in place when you when you left, or they're just being. Formed. They were. Okay. Yeah, they were. They were. So, um, and I'll go ahead and tell you, like I talked to like a lot of my friends at Amazon who were still there, and obviously, um, I help a ton of people here at Keras get jobs at Amazon and AWS. So they always tell me about this too. But these are the two leadership principles that uh, are not used that often. Right. Okay. Especially okay. if you have more experienced leadership principal, uh, more experienced Amazonians, um, who have, uh, who have worked with, uh, you know, you know, all the other ones and those are the kind of the building blocks. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of them is, um, uh, success and scale bring broad responsibility. Right. So like 
Yeah. Success and scale, yeah. rerun responsibility. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? So like, um, you know, you want to talk about a time when you, um, you had, you made a choice that was, uh, intended for customers to be successful, right? Um, uh, at a, at a bigger level, right? Um, it also talks about your opportunities to do things for like, uh, more like sustainable options, right? Um, or how are you thinking about the world in comparison to like what your decisions can be made at Amazon? It's very difficult to do that if you're at a company, obviously it's a lot in s- smaller scale, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, how are you making decisions that are related to the, the better good, um, mm-hmm. for the, for the company, right? Um, mm-hmm. so like it's, uh, it, not just the company, but for the world, right? So like what, like, what have you done? Is, is it, um, like, for example, DocuSign, right? Company I work with currently, uh, they're, they will plant a tree for every candidate that signs a DocuSign letter, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's doing, it's bringing a broad responsibility to the world and talk, and, and maybe you were the person that implemented that and you focused on, uh, okay, each offer letter will be associated with us planting a tree or, um, you, you built a program called Impact, right? Lates back to my DocuSign currently, um, that focuses on the, you know, you doing things that, that help the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you built out a policy where you created a, uh, a voluntary time off or you could take mm-hmm. voluntary time to go work on some kind of initiative or impact or something like that. So, um, it, it might seem kind of fluffy, but, it's really based on your ability to uh, to make and accomplish not just things for financial reasons, but also making mm. the, the world a better place. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, so there's more. Yeah, absolutely. So it's more more around the purpose and I guess that sustainability. And I think you know not just your customers and the world. I mean, very broad, but also in you know your employees and your team as well. So I imagine it also includes like internal initiatives and like employee resource sort of groups and like different d- different uh, diversity initiatives like there's all, all sorts of stuff that's that's going on that you can do um both internally and, and externally yeah agreed agreed um and then the other one uh strive to be the world's best employer uh that is kind of related to it but it's talking mm. about you know how are how are you uh seeing things that are happening at the company that are not mm-hmm. correct and how mm-hmm. are you st- standing up to that right for example one of the questions is tell me about a time when you um you had to, uh to stand up for someone that couldn't defend themselves in the workplace right mm-hmm. or or tell me about a time when and you mentioned diversity and actually a diversity question like tell me about a time when you actively uh took diversity seriously when building your team or mm-hmm. uh, or or building out your group so mm-hmm. striving to be the best world's best employer really relates to uh making sure that you're you're fighting for really things that should not be happening or mm-hmm. uh initiatives that should be happening within your company and and how you demonstrated that and uh and, and what was the end result of that so uh, and that can also be for situations where maybe you did the right thing uh, and it didn't work out, but you you stood up anyway and you voiced your opinion. You might have been in a situation where uh, your company wasn't quite ready to stand up with you, depending on you know, whatever your belief is, but mm-hmm. um, you still were able to do that and, and you could show that you do stand up for um, bad behavior or things that might be unethical or... Uh, uh, not give the company uh, a, a good look in the private eye and the public eye. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It it sounds like these these are new, but like there's this obviously precedent and uh, all these hiring managers and bar raisers who have been using the other fourteen principles for a very long time. So probably take some time for these to to get instilled and. And I think like maybe the newer generation of Amazon leaders in the next five to 10 years will, will be taking these uh, a lot more seriously, I imagine. Um, so yeah, I think they're still important. Yeah. 
Yeah, and since I've been, uh, you know, I was at the company when these were announced, mm-hmm. and I've obviously I've been, you know, still very close to Amazon through my coaching, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I've only seen one loop in a year mm. where I've coached that these leadership principles were used, right? Mm. Yeah, um, okay. I, I usually I usually try to educate my people that I, I coach the right questions to prepare for. Um, and I mean, I've only had one, I usually do like a postmortem with them, like a mm-hmm. meeting afterwards. And usually that postmortem will tell me, but I've only heard of one that's gotten these two. But again, to your okay. point, uh, these are newer and maybe they just need a new generation of Amazonians to, to lead these in the future. So. Cool. Cool, man. Well, well, th- thanks for sharing all that. I think we've, we've gone through quite a lot and, uh, you know, again, part this is part two of, of our conversation. We've gone through all the principles. You've shared a ton of useful examples. Is there anything else that you, you, you want to highlight on these principles? Because we, we've basically gone through them individually and you've sort of spoken about how some of them connect to each other. Uh, and I, I think it can be, can be a little bit overwhelming, obviously, if you're just looking at all these and you're trying to remember them. Um, but can you can you share anything else or give any other advice around around these principles and maybe sort of how to think about them and how to approach them? Yeah. So my first thing is, while the leadership principles are very important and, you know, you're ranked against the leadership principles in an interview. Right. So, like, if you have five interviewers and you're non-tech, you're going to get 10 leadership principles <laughs> that you're going to get rated against. Right. So uh, it's very important to be have examples that you raise the bar for all those respective leadership principles. But what a lot of people mess up and do is they get so focused on having an example for each leadership principle, but instead of doing that, have examples where you're focused on um, multiple leadership principles, right? Um, and, Cause here's the thing, unless you're L8 or above, you can use an example more than once. You can actually use an example twice in your interview. So if you get the question, tell me about a time when you had a complex problem with a simple solution. And then you have, tell me about a time when you had to challenge the status quo. Those are two different leadership principles. Those are the same questions that are asked. And you can use the exact same example for both of them, right? So um, if, if you're watching this, I highly recommend you get with a Keras coach. Because a Keras coach, what they can do is they can actually tell you what the questions are going to be in your interview. And what that will help you do is instead of you focusing on the leadership principle, you can then focus on the questions, which I believe is, what is far more important. Because again, if you think about earned trust and you're just, you're just trying to create an example for earned trust, you go, Oh, let me think about a time when I had to, you know, earn the trust of a customer. But those specific questions that I was telling you guys about earlier, it, those, those are, those are very difficult questions to be able to create answers to if you're just creating earned trust, right? Like tell me about a time you made a commitment and you couldn't deliver it as promised to a stakeholder. That's a very hard question to answer. And if you don't know that that's a question now you do, obviously, but if you don't know that's a question or you don't know like all the other very hard questions that are in all those leadership principles, it's very hard to study for that, right? So I highly recommend going to a, a Keras coach who can help you focus on questions versus leadership principles because that's going to set you up for success a lot better. Awesome, man. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, I think like what you said, when you're coming up with an example, you're going to have multiple things that happen in that example, right? Your biggest success will also maybe be an example of some bias for action that you showed and uh, diving deep and to, to gather the data. So, so one, one story, right. can actually touch on multiple principles, which I think is what they want to see anyways. Uh, otherwise it's going to be really tough to do that. So all really, really great tips and advice. Um, and, uh, thank you also for plugging the coaching in there. That, that was very kind of you. Um, and I will link back of course, to your profile, uh, as a coach and people can, you know, if people listening like what you've said and, and they want to uh, talk to you more one-on-one about their Amazon interview or application or offer that they're negotiating, they can do that with you directly. And um, 
I think there's a, a lot of ideas that popped into my head after our conversation. I was thinking like, how do these leadership principles relate to parenting? Totally different topic, but I imagine I imagine you could probably uh, use some of them in, in other parts of your life as well uh, if you really take them to heart. So, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I haven't been at Amazon in a year, but I still use them to, to help me lead, right? Mm-hmm. Amazon was a very important time in my life, even though I, I don't plan to go back anytime soon, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but, but like it was a very important time in my life where I learned a lot of things about leadership. I learned a lot of things about customer obsession and I learned about insisting on the highest standard to a level that I, I never could have dreamed that my bar could go to. And once you start insisting on high standards, you never want to go back, right? Because you're so used to those high standards. Um, and that, and that's for everything, for your life, for your kids, for your, your work, for your goals, everything. Your relationship, so yeah. Your, yeah. your relationship, right? <laughs> You're, uh, raising a dog, whatever you want to do, right? So like, uh, the leadership principles are, are keys to success. And, uh, Amazon uses them in a way that's, it's actually not cultish. They use them in a way that's like, okay, let's, let's guide us to the right decision versus like, cause like most companies are like, man, this seems very cultish. Amazon does not feel that way at all. It just feels like you're trying to do what's best for the company when abiding by them. Yeah, I love that because a lot of people will say when they look at the leadership principles, like, oh, this is this is a cult. I mean, they're they're just following these sort of blindly and and uh, that that's not the case. Like you said, it's they're actually using these day to day for decision making and in, in the language. And uh, but but it's it's logical. It's not like they're blindly following them right um because these principles sort of they push they push against each other in different ways and they play against each other right so there's a lot of maybe checks and balances uh in 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 that way but um yeah so i think we're coming up on time and uh i really had a lot of fun learned a lot today and uh hope to have you on the podcast again sometime awesome Thanks a lot, Misha. Had a great time. Thanks, Eric. All right, take care. All right. See you. Bye. Alrighty. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric. He is full of knowledge and experience from his time at Amazon that I think just really poured out in our conversation today. So, uh, yeah, th- th- there's a lot of stuff in there. So I-, I hope I hope you found that useful. And if you liked what so what he was saying, or you want to uh, follow up uh, with him. If you have some questions about specific leadership principles, or you're going in for an interview, you want you want Eric's help to uh, to really practice practice those um, uh, stories and examples you've you've prepared for your interview in, in sort of a mock interview setting. Then uh, I will link back to Eric's profile in the show notes so you can go chat with him, have a call with him, uh, as well as other uh, uh, other coaches who who've got experience at Amazon, uh, which you can find through. Um, through my site, karis.io. So I am uh, yeah excited to share this with you guys. And also we have some upcoming episodes and conversations around offer negotiation, which um, will be a new topic that I'm diving into in this podcast. So looking forward to that. And as usual, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, then please reach out to me by email or if this is something you're listening to or watching on YouTube, then feel free to comment below. All right. Well, I hope you guys have a great rest of the week and I will see you next time.